Whether or not the Trojan War actually occurred is something that has been debated by academics and by amateur enthusiasts for at least a century and a half. The Greeks and the Romans certainly thought it happened, although medieval and early modern scholars were far less certain than their ancient counterparts. In the modern day, thanks to the work of Frank Calvert and Heinrich Schliemann in the middle of the 19th century, we now know at the very least that the city of Troy itself was real, and that it was centered on the archaeological site of Hisarlik, near the Aegean coast of modern-day Turkey. That city is likely to be identified with the city that Hittite documents refer to as Wylusa, which is probably the same place that the poet Homer calls Ilios. But, was there a Trojan War? And if there was, then was there in fact a Trojan horse? Well, scholars are broadly divided into two camps here. The first camp thinks that there was no war, and that if we did not have the Iliad, the Odyssey, and fragments of a few other texts which talk about the Trojan War, because after all it involves the Olympian gods intervening, and some other fantastic improbabilities, then we would not in fact ever be discussing whether or not a Trojan War actually happened. Essentially, these texts are to be taken as literature according to this argument and nothing more. The other group does believe that there was a conflict, but they then divide into two smaller camps. Those who think that there was a Trojan War between some members of Mycenaean Greece and the city of Troy and perhaps some Trojan allies, and those who think that there were multiple conflicts and that these conflicts either became meshed together in the surviving literature, which we today know as the Epic Cycle, or that these were all fragmentary records of just one conflict out of many different wars which involved the historical city of Troy. So, what I want to do in this video is take a look at the latter position, that the Trojan War did indeed happen, at least in some form, and specifically I want to look at two intriguing ideas that float around from time to time. The first is that the Trojan horse is a memory not of a siege engine, but of an earthquake, and the other is that Troy was destroyed not by the Mycenaeans per se, but rather by the Sea People who were mentioned in Egyptian records. So, the first thing we need to do is talk about the date. If there was a Trojan War, why is it dated to, broadly, the end of the Bronze Age in the Eastern Mediterranean? Well, the Greeks dated the war to what we, with our calendar, would understand to be roughly between 1334 BC and about 1135 BC, somewhere in that time range. So, how are they calculating this? The extremely short, simple answer is that the Greek conception of time was broken up into five ages, with each age declining in terms of, well, pretty much everything. Human stature, longevity, the arrival of pain and hardship, etc., compared to the age that came before. The age in which the classical Greeks lived was known as the Age of Iron, and prior to that was the Age of Heroes, when the Trojan War was believed to have been fought, and that was believed to have been to the Greeks, a long time ago. The historian Herodotus dated the Trojan War to 800 years before his time. Another dated it to 1,000 years before Alexander the Great visited Troy in 334 BC, which would then put the conflict at about 1334 BC. And eventually, another date arises placing the Trojan War 407 years before the First Olympics, which then placed the war at 1184 BC. There is then another calculation that places it at about 1135 BC. So, in terms of historical textual evidence, we have, of course, the Homeric epics. These texts and the historicity of Homer are wrapped up in what's called the Homeric question. Essentially, was Homer real? If he was, was he a single person? Or a collection of individuals? And are the Iliad and the Odyssey historically accurate to any meaningful degree? I am going to eventually do a video on the subject, so to summarize the whole thing in about two sentences, it's fairly complicated. We do know from other examples that in the general region of southeastern Europe, and probably Asia Minor as well, that there was a tradition of memorizing epic poetry and stories based on a repeating rhythm and rhyming scheme which aided in memorization. But details varied based on the poet and the audience in question, so it's entirely possible that the epics were transmitted orally until written down around 800 BC, give or take a few years, but the poems do contain details relevant to both the Aegean Bronze Age and the Iron Age, 
So it's very likely that if a Bronze Age epic formed the basis for the Iliad or the Odyssey, the city of Troy may very well be remembered, and perhaps a war or wars as well, but other elements likely crept in. There is an argument that the inclusion of some Greek heroes would be an example of this, being pulled from other stories and thus inserted into the Iliad. So there's that. And we also have several letters from Mycenaean Greek and Hittite contexts concerning a war, or maybe wars, plural, involving or revolving around a region of Anatolia where the historical city of Troy was located. In their capital city of Hattusa, archaeologists have excavated tablets written in Hittite and other languages which mention the city of Oilusa, which we know as Troy, that was engaged in at least four wars with the Hittites during the Late Bronze Age, but there are other documents which suggest that at one point the two were allies following a war fought between the Hittites and the Trojans at some point in the 13th century BC. Unfortunately, however, we don't seem to be able to pinpoint a more precise date at this time. Those same Hittite archives turned up documents which mention a territory and a people called Ahiyawa, which the vast majority of Bronze Age specialists identify with the Achaeans, one of the Homeric names for the Mycenaean Greeks. And some of those same documents discuss Ahiyawan attacks in western Anatolia during the 15th century. The other position is that Ahiyawa should not be identified with the Achaeans, but the problem is that if that position is taken, then Hittite documents mention this large, powerful confederacy that we simply have no evidence for outside of a name when there is in fact a material culture that fits the description right next door across the Aegean. At some point in the late 15th century BC, Hittite documents mention a rebellion in a place known as Asua, with a confederation of 22 cities probably led by Troy, and another document mentions that a king of the Ahiyawans led some sort of military expedition there around the same time. Archaeologists have also discovered a Mycenaean sword in the region, and while that by itself does not necessarily suggest a Mycenaean presence, at the very least it suggests that maybe some sort of trading relation was in existence. That sword has an inscription on it which reads as follows. As to Talia, the great king shouted the Asua country, he dedicated these swords to the storm god, his lord. So what we're looking at here, and the chronology is not exactly certain, is a military engagement or engagements in which the Mycenaeans either supplied weapons to the Asuans and thus Troy, or perhaps had a military presence during the conflict, and we know that the Hittites eventually won. Letters dating to the late 13th century discovered in the Hittite archives mention that a king of Wailusa had been driven from his lands, in other words, probably overthrown, and he was to be reinstated with Hittite military aid and then become a vassal. The overall point is that there are textual references to a series of military conflicts, at least one of which possibly involved the Mycenaeans. So, does this confirm the historicity of the Homeric epics? Well, not necessarily, but we do know that there was a war which involved Troy. There was a lot more that can be said, and whether or not the Trojan War occurred is a subject that will be getting its own video, but I wanted to take a moment and talk a bit about the evidence for war involving Troy and the dates of some of those conflicts, the late 15th and the late 13th centuries BC respectively, because this is where the two ideas being covered in this video will come into play. When Heinrich Schliemann dug trenches at the Mound of Hisserlich, he cut through multiple archaeological layers, and in doing so, he thought he had dug through six different levels of habitation, but today we know it was actually nine each with its own sublayers in the archaeological stratigraphy. Out of all of the different layers, he thought that the city which was described in the Homeric epics was the layer known as Troy II, and this is where he allegedly found the treasure of Priam, although it probably was not in one single hoard. He probably cobbled it together and made the story up, as we know he was liable to do. In any case, further digging confirmed that Troy II was far too old for the date of the Trojan War, which Greeks, and later the Romans, dated to sometime between 1334 and about 1135 BC. Troy II, on the other hand, dates between about 2500 and about 2300 BC, and he was later forced to admit this in the face of overwhelming evidence and in part ended his days as a deeply depressed man, 
Because of the realization that, in digging down through the layers, he and his team had destroyed many of the artifacts dating to the layer during which the Trojan War, if it did happen, probably occurred, that layer being Troy 7A. However, there is a problem with this layer, and that is one of chronology. After Heinrich Schliemann died in 1890, his architect, Dorpfeld, took over the excavation and focused on Troy 6, which was first settled around 1700 BC. There are eight sublevels to Troy 6, with Troy 7A, the first level of the city usually associated with the Trojan War, coming right after the eighth level of Troy 6, known as Troy 6H. And in continuing excavations, what Dorpfeld found was that the Mount of Hisserlik is probably best identified not with the city of Troy, but with its central citadel, and the presence of Mycenaean Greek artifacts in the citadel and the surrounding area led him to believe that Troy 6H, not 7A, was the city of the Homeric epics, backed up by the fact that Troy 6H appears to have been violently destroyed and burned around 1300 BC. When excavations at the site began again in the 1930s, new evidence was found that strongly challenged this interpretation. Just behind the main wall, varying between 5 and 6 meters in depth, were a series of massive deposits of archaeological material which showed continuous habitation with no breaks between all eight levels of Troy 6, and then what appeared to be a continuous habitation up into level Troy 7a, leading to the argument that this should not, in fact, be Troy 7a, that is to say, a new layer, but rather a ninth layer of Troy 6, named Troy 6i. Dorpfeld agreed with this. Essentially, 7A doesn't really look like a new city, so much as it looks like 6H reconstructed after heavy damage, but by this point, 7A had fallen into common usage. More and more Mycenaean pottery was turning up at Troy 6H, and 7A as digging continued over the course of the 20th century, and although 6H did show strong evidence of destruction and quite a bit of fire, Mycenaean pottery and local imitations were found continuously in the stratigraphy since it was first found at layer 6a. In other words, although the city was destroyed and was rebuilt, archaeologists were not finding any sort of evidence or war or invasion, at least not from the Greeks. Instead, it looked like the Trojans were engaging in continuous trading relations with the Greeks, which confused archaeologists because it seemed that the Trojan War had not happened at all. Homer does not describe a peaceful relationship between the two parties, he describes a war, and the burning of a city. So, what could have happened in between the layers of 6H and 7A? Well, there seems to have been evidence of an earthquake. Large stone blocks, including towers and portions of the fortification wall, had been knocked about, and earthquakes are not unknown in the area. Hisulik is actually near a fault line which has been documented to be active as late as the 1990s. So, a new argument began to be developed. It should not be Troy 7a which was attacked by the Mycenaeans because that was not a wealthy city as Homer describes, but rather Troy 6h, the preceding layer. But Homer does not mention an earthquake, unless he actually does. Greek mythology tells us that the horse is the symbol of Poseidon, god of the sea, and that the crashing of waves was caused by the running of the horses that pulled his chariot and a similar explanation was applied to earthquakes. Poseidon, after all, was known as the Earthshaker. So the argument, and it should be noted that this is something of a speculative argument, is that the Trojan horse is a metaphor for an earthquake that severely damaged the walls of Troy 6H, and the Greeks then took advantage of this during a war and attacked the city and sacked it. Therefore, it would help explain why Troy 7A was rebuilt but maintains cultural continuity, and why there does not appear to be much evidence of a sack, because that damage was covered up by the earthquake. Because 7a does not appear to show much of a cultural break, if any at all, with 6h, then perhaps the Trojan horse being a symbol for an earthquake in the Homeric epics makes sense, if you consider that 7a was very much not a wealthy, powerful city that accords much better with the evidence for layer 6h. So, it would be a way to end the Iliad on a high note, so to speak, and not take into account the fact that no matter what happened, Troy seemed to have survived.
This was an interesting idea, and it did catch the eye of some experts, but it was challenged in the 1990s when the pottery was redated. The argument about the city being damaged by an earthquake held, because it appeared to account for the structural damage to Troy 6H, but the redating of the pottery found in that layer by Penelope Mountjoy moved the date back from about 1100 BC to about 1300 BC. In other words, about 200 years too early for both the traditional dating according to the Greeks and the Romans, and about 100 years too early for whatever sort of conflict happened at the end of the 12th century, as documented in Hittite texts. So that puts Troy 6H at about 1300, but we now also know that Troy 7A, which subsequently dates to the 13th century, was apparently destroyed around 1180 BC, making its destruction part of the Late Bronze Age collapse between approximately 1200 and approximately 1150 BC. Would this destruction then fit the Trojan War if that indeed happened? After all, we have at least one Hittite text from the 13th century which tells us that Troy was attacked by unknown invaders and that its king was apparently driven away. So in other words, a handful of decades prior to archaeological evidence of destruction. This is, essentially, the major problem with working with textual and material evidence for this particular topic. There are quite a lot of Hittite texts sitting in archives in universities and museums, which are currently awaiting translation by specialists, but the texts that we do have translated and that are worked with that do mention fighting like this seem to miss the archaeological evidence by a little bit. So we should not try to force the evidence that we currently have together, but it is somewhat tantalizing to try and connect them because we have evidence of destruction. So what does that destruction look like? Well, there have been skeletons excavated at this layer, and there are scorch marks on some of the stones, as well as many arrowheads, which appear to have their origin in the Aegean. It really does look like Troy 7A was attacked, and the cramped buildings that were excavated in the citadel have been interpreted as evidence of a city under siege. Initially, pinning this attack on the Mycenaeans made sense because the destruction of 7A was dated to the middle of the 13th century. However, the redating of Pottery's shards in the 1990s, which pushed Troy 6H back to about 1300, also showed that the destruction of Troy 7A was around 1180 BC, and that caused a chronological problem because the Mycenaeans by that point appeared to have been gone for at least two decades, and if we're reading the evidence correctly, probably at least something like three decades. This is where we come to the other hypothesis that we're looking at in this video, that the Sea Peoples destroyed the city. Who the Sea People were is one of the great questions facing specialists in the late Bronze Age Near East, and it's not necessarily any closer to being answered today than it was 20 or 30 years ago. The interconnected system that we call the Bronze Age in the Eastern Mediterranean collapsed in the 12th century BC, with cities being abandoned and being destroyed all throughout the region, and with the most devastating period occurring roughly between 1207 and 1177 BC. And within that period, the absolute worst destruction occurs between 1195 and 1177 BC. Many of these regions show evidence of what should probably be interpreted as severe economic and demographic collapse, or at the very least, extreme decline. We have, incidentally, the most evidence for Greece where the archaeology indicates that population levels declined by about two-thirds across numerous sites, and going along with that is the collapse of the Mycenaean palaces. This happened in at least two phases. The first around 1250 BC saw several sites attacked, burned, and if not abandoned, at least shrinking in size. Following that, the palace complexes were more heavily fortified, but it would seem that it was all for nothing, because around 1190, the rest of the palaces suffered further attacks. Greece was not the only place to have these issues. Famously, or perhaps infamously, the city of Ugarit, located in modern-day Syria, with a population of about 8,000 was attacked, burned, and then abandoned in about 1190 BC. And three other sites nearby suffered the same fate. Egyptian texts from this period tell of two attacks by a group known as the Sea People, who first attempted to invade Egypt in about 1207 BC and then later in about 1177 BC. So the older explanation for why all of this destruction occurred, 
for why Greece, the Levantine cities, and the Hittite Empire collapsed was to blame the Sea People. The gist of the modern scholarship has been to move away from this and to emphasize a perfect storm of events. Migration, climate change, famine, war, and political and economic problems all struck at the same time. It is in this context that the argument that Troy 7a was destroyed by the Sea People needs to be understood. So, who were the Sea People? Well, there are two answers here. Answer number one isn't so much an answer, so much as an admission that we probably can't know for certain, because the evidence is sort of garbled and extremely limited. Our sources for who the Sea People were largely stem from two places. The first place is the city of Ugarit, where we have some texts which describe warfare, raiding, and burning by people who came from the sea. The second, much more famous piece of evidence comes from Egypt, where we have records of two different pharaohs defeating the so-called Sea People in two battles 30 years apart. That's really about it, which is why the first answer, basically that we can't really know, exists. It's not so much a cop-out so much as it is an honest admission about the limited nature of our source material. The Egyptian texts, though, provide just enough evidence that specialists on the Late Bronze Age have attempted to try and tease out who these people were and where they came from. The Egyptian evidence is by far our most substantial, and we have three inscriptions located at Cairo, Thebes, and Athrubis, which state that in the 5th and 6th years of the reign of the pharaoh Merneptah, the pharaoh won a victory over these sea peoples, and this is generally dated in our calendars to what we would understand to be 1207 BC. Another inscription from Medinit Habu, the mortuary temple of Ramses III, is the other major source for the sea people in Egypt, and that inscription tells us that, quote, the foreign countries made a conspiracy in their islands. All at once the lands were removed and scattered in the fray. No land could stand before their arms, from Hatti, Korde, Karkemes, Orzawa, and Alashia, being cut off or destroyed at this one time. That inscription continues with a description of all these lands being laid waste, and that these people who caused the destruction then advanced toward Egypt with fire and with bloodshed. It then lists the name of these groups, and this is where scholarly activity in attempting to determine the identity of these attackers really begins to take off. The inscriptions of Merneptah list the Sea Peoples as the following groups. The Ekwesh, the Luka, the Shalakesh, the Sherdin, and the Teresh. While the inscription of Ramses III lists them as the Denyan, the Peliset, the Shalakesh, the Sherdin, the Teresh, the Tjeker, and the Weshesh. So, there is some overlap in the groups despite being separated by about 30 years. Notably the Shekelesh, the Sherdin, and the Teresh. Ramses II encountered at least the Sherdin and the Luka, apparently during the Battle of Kadesh, but there was not an invasion of Egypt. His son, Merneptah, defeated these groups, and then Ramses III defeated these groups as well. In addition to a Semitic-speaking people, the Shashu, in two battles, one in the Nile Delta itself and the other on land. The problem with using these texts as sources of information is that these are inscriptions and reliefs which are deeply ideological in nature. It's entirely possible that the groups in question were made out to be larger than they were in order to bolster the standing of Merdaptah and Ramses III. But it's also possible that these were smaller encounters that were conflated into a handful of large battles for propaganda purposes. Despite these caveats, the Egyptologists who accept that we can try and tease out who the Sea People were, accept the very basic outline of what these texts tell us. In general, what scholars have attempted to do is take the names of these groups and some other groups or areas that are mentioned with them but who don't appear to be considered Sea People in the Egyptian texts, and match them with other groups or places that are mentioned in earlier sources and that are known. Sometimes this is doable, and it's not controversial to, for example, connect the Egyptian Hatti to the Hittite Empire, or to connect the Luka Sea people as either a group stemming from or simply being the entire region of Luka in southern Anatolia. What you would then expect to see if these people originated in the eastern Mediterranean is a broad arc of destruction sweeping across the coastal Near East until it hit Egypt. That is, in fact, what you see in the archaeology, but it doesn't necessarily have to mean that it was done by the Sea People. 
And that is complicated when the other groups that don't appear to have cognates in the Bronze Age Near East or the Eastern Mediterranean are brought into the picture. The Sherden, for example, sound like they maybe come from Sardinia, and the Teresh, while still being unclear, are hypothesized by some archaeologists and historians to have come from somewhere in the Tyrrhenian Sea. We do know that Mycenaean pottery and other goods show up in these regions as well as on Sicily, sometimes identified with the Shekelesh, so Italy and the surrounding region was certainly tied into the broader Bronze Age Mediterranean world. It would not be out of the question for groups in those lands, having contacts with Greeks and others to head in that direction if something bad occurred in Sardinia or Sicily. This is where Troy comes back into the picture, because if you remove the known groups from the Sea People, and you then remove the Sheridan, the Shekelesh, and the Teresh, the argument is that most of those who remain, the Weshes, the Tejeko, the Dendian, the Peleset, etc., may very well have names that are Egyptian forms of Mycenaean Greek names, the Dendian being the Danaan, one of the names for the Greeks used in the Iliad, for example. The exceptions here are probably the Tejekur, which in ancient Egyptian may have sounded something more along the lines of Sickle, hence Sicily, but that's nearly impossible to prove, and the Peleset, who are likely the Philistines of the Old Testament. So what would have brought these people towards Egypt? Why leave Sardinia, Sicily, and Italy if that is indeed where the Sherden, Shekelesh, Teres, and Jekyll originated? And why would you leave Greece if that is what the Denyan, the Weshes, and others did? Well, the term Mycenaean refers less to a unified ethnic group than it does to an archaeological culture based around shared material goods, such as common pottery styles, that sort of thing. That is not to say that these people weren't Greeks. We know they spoke Greek or at least used it as a scribal language, but the textual sources from the Bronze Age tell us that the Mycenaean Greeks were more divided than an archaeological overview can make it seem. They probably spoke different dialects of Greek in addition to other languages, and the point is that this isn't really a unified ethnic group, and we don't have evidence of a unified political system in the sense of a modern nation-state like Greece does today. What we have instead are multiple palaces and fortresses and cities, and many different names, which implies competition and conflict. Our understanding of the chronology of the Bronze Age collapse is continually evolving, but it's entirely possible, indeed likely, that the network of towns, cities, and palaces in Greece suffered a combination of raids, climate-induced problems, and political chaos, which set off some of the groups associated with the Sea Peoples. This doesn't necessarily have to be a unified, coordinated event. It could just be a response among various groups to chaos in the Aegean. Our means of reconstructing fluctuations in the climate are becoming more and more precise every year, although archaeologists are not able to pinpoint events to certain years. As of right now, what they're able to do through ice cores and sampling pollen, which has somehow miraculously survived, to name just two techniques, is that we are able to broadly correlate things like droughts or cold snaps to around a decade. Sometimes it's a bit more precise, it depends on the event in question. What we are learning from that is that there were basically a series of droughts in the 13th and the early 12th centuries BC, and the archaeology of Central and Southern Europe strongly suggests that there was some sort of a collapse of the Urnfield culture, accompanied by the rise of fortified settlements. So it's possible that disruptions due to war and climate forced people living around Italy to flee, where they then went to the Aegean, and this is perhaps backed up by the presence of Sardinian, neuralgic pottery in Crete dating to this time. Of course, that might not have happened, or at least not in that way. We need a lot more research. But destruction layers of the Greek palaces and cities between about 1250 and about 1180 BC do correlate with the appearance of at least some of the Sea Peoples in Egyptian records. And I think Eric Klein sums the whole thing up rather well in his book, The Trojan War, a very short introduction, when he writes the following. The timing is certainly right for the Sea Peoples to have attacked and destroyed Troy 7a as part of their larger campaign of destruction, and some have suggested that survivors of the ravaged city joined the Sea Peoples in their subsequent activities. It is, however, not clear whether the Sea Peoples ever actually attacked Troy, and so the identity of the destroyers of Troy 7A remains an open question, as does the destruction of Troy 7B1 and 7B2, 
If the event that caused the destruction of the city were to be dated as late as 1180 BC, then the destruction could as readily be linked with the invasion of the Sea Peoples during the time of Ramses III as it could with the Mycenaeans. This dating, though, is based on the latest possible date for Mycenaean pottery, analyzed by Penelope Mountjoy, so the attack could just as easily have taken place a few decades earlier, according to the same study. If that were the case, then the destruction could be linked to the initial overthrow of Walamu, king of Walusa, as recorded in Hittite tablets and could implicate the Mycenaeans after all. This hypothesis, however, is highly speculative.